the goodness of Jesus. And all he's done for me. Come on, my soul. Every now and then on the cloud. Somebody say hallelujah in this house. <laughs> Anybody had to encourage themselves before? Anybody ever been in a situation where nobody else understood what you were going through? You couldn't really talk to nobody about it. You just had to talk to God and encourage yourself and encourage yourself. And then all of a sudden, the pressure went away. Woo! He's worthy, I tell you. He's worthy. Amen. <laughs> Go ahead and grab your sermon notes. Grab your sermon notes. Go ahead your sermon notes. They have little holes punched in the side for you to get your little sermon notebooks if you want to keep all these together. But God is good, isn't he? Amen. Now grab somebody and look at them and smile at them if you can. If you can smile at them, look at them and say, Today, just for a little while, the pastor is going to preach about doing good in a bad world. Amen. 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 Now, I know we feel good right now, but can we, can we do good in a, in a, in a bad world? Who, who knows sometimes it's hard to do good? In a bad world. We're in a sermon series we're calling The Fruit of the Spirit, Nine Flavors, One Fruit. And we've been dealing with this for the last five weeks. This is part six. And uh, our theme passage for today is, uh, for the whole sermon series is Galatians chapter five, amen, 22 and 23. And let's read together with great enthusiasm. One, two, three, read. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things. Somebody give God some praise. Amen. See, here's the deal. I want you to stop right now, even if you are just watching this online or you are in line, I want you to just imagine yourself. I need you to picture yourself. Come on, now think about it. What would my life be like if I had on my branches the fruit of the Spirit? No, for real, think about that. I need you to see it. Because see, if you can't imagine it, you will never possess it. Can, can, can you see how your relationships would change if you had God's love? If you had joy? How would your workplace change if you had peace of mind, no matter what they're talking about? How would you work better with people if you had patience with difficult people? Think about all those things. Think about the fact that, that goodness and kindness and, and gentleness and self-control. How would your health be if you just had a little more self-control? Amen. And you had water instead of Pepsi. That's what I'm just saying. Just, just how, how would everything change in your life? Now, here's the good news. Anybody ready for some good news? The good news is you don't have to be a super saint to have the fruit of the Spirit. You can be a brand new Christian, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, if we let him, if we cooperate with him, even the newest believer can be kind and gentle and patient and loving and joyful and peaceful and self-control and, yes, even have some goodness in a bad world. Isn't that something? So now look at this. Your, your memory verse for to this week is uh, for 2 Thessalonians 3. 13 and 14, this is the New King James, it says this. Now, this is one of those kind of heavy ones. This is not, this is, this is, this is one of those verses that make you say, what? Here it is, check this out. It says, but as for you, brethren, talking about people in the church, brothers and sisters, you know, brethren, okay? Do not grow weary in doing what? Good. And if anyone <clears throat> does not obey our word in this epistle, 
note that person and do not keep company with him. What? That they might be ashamed. Be ashamed. What? Wait a minute, let's read that again. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey the, our word in this epistle, note that person and don't keep company with them that they may be ashamed. Look up here. Here's what, here's what he's saying. He's saying something. He says, first of all, uh, don't get tired of doing what's right. Anybody ever just got tired of being the right person? Like you got to always be the one to understand. You got to always be the one to give in. You got to always want to be the one to apologize, even when you ain't did nothing wrong. Sometimes you just want to be bad. Anybody? I don't know about you. I, 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 I know you're in church. I know you're in church. But have y'all just wanted to be the bad guy? It, it's just once in a while you want to tear something up just every now and then, just like tan it up, you know. But that ain't what God wants. He said, "Don't get weary now. Don't get tired of holding the right." Then He says, "Now check this out. This is where this is where the word comes in. Check this out." He says. And those in the church who are brothers in Christ, who are not willing to come up to the level and live the life, note them and don't associate with them. We had some people in our choir got upset because, you know, we said you can't sing. They could sing. I mean, they had the ability to sing, but their lifestyle wasn't fruitful. And they got upset. We had about seven, eight, maybe nine people upset with the pastor. And I was trying to see, I was trying to get them to see. Now, Valveta, for those of you who are first time here, Valveta, that's my wife. Okay, we married. Okay. <laughs> Last month, 25 years married. Okay, anyway. But just imagine, though, take this out. Take this out. If we wasn't married, we'd just stand together. Y'all be like, no, nah, Pastor, I ain't going to be able to do that. I ain't going to be able to come up in here. No. Nah. Y'all wouldn't even come. We wouldn't need no full service. We, need, we wouldn't even need one. I'm saying if I got to hold up to that standard, then how you going to come in here and sing me happy and come on now, the, the praise dancers, how you going, how you going to dance me happy? And then you see when you come, see when you're a new believer in Christ, that's different. But as you began to grow in the Lord and you began to take on different roles and leadership positions, your lifestyle got to come up with your responsibility. And sometimes you have to tell people you're doing a good job with this activity, but your life does not match. So you got to get that life part together before you can do the ministry part on this level. Now, there's some things you can serve in. You can serve, you can serve. But when you start talking about leading, now, hey, hey, hey. It's making any sense. And so sometimes we have to hold people accountable, and we don't want to do it because that's not fun. It's not friendly. It's not easy. People get upset and leave. But, but God says, it's important that you do this. Why is it so important? Check this out. This is why it's so important. Check this out. It's because most people that don't go to church, when I talk to them, their biggest complaint is not God. It's people who go to church. Because we say one thing in the building and live another thing in the street, and they say, ain't no sense me going out there wasting my time and ain't changing you. In other words, it, it, it impacts our witness. And look what Jesus said in, in Acts 1 and 8. He says, you will be my witnesses. He says, what's going to happen is, he says, your lifestyle is going to change things. And here's the important part. I need you to really take this home. The reason why America is in such trouble right now is that non-Christians have taken over leadership. And they making the rules that don't line up with our values. See, it wasn't a non-Christian that voted to take prayer out of school. You know that, right? You know, you know that, that wouldn't have happened. But when the, when the tide shifts and we stop witnessing and we stop living right, people stop coming to church and stop living for God, then other people got in there and did their own thing. So we got to blame ourselves because when I go to Walmart, I need to be doing good. When I go to work, I need to be doing good. When I'm at home, I need to be doing good. When I'm at the bowling alley, I need to be doing what? Good. You can't be a raggedy Christian and think it's going to have an impact on the world. Well, it has an impact. It just has a negative. Is it me? So write this down. In a mean world, in a bad world, in a mean world, our best, our greatest witness is showing mercy. 
So, so in other words, God says, when you live the right lifestyle, when you hold each other accountable, then everybody comes up to the level, and, then, and, and it's, a tr it's attractive to other people. See, when, when we are blessed by God because we're living the best we can and, and people can see the change in our life, that's attractive, and more people want God than they want the world. And he says, so the best way of being a witness, we could go any way with this, but one of the ways we can do it is by showing mercy to others. Everybody say, show some mercy. So now here's the deal. The Bible says in Luke 6, 36, show mercy just as your father, what? Shows mercy. All right. God is merciful. So then therefore, his children ought to be what? Merciful. And so what people want to know is that, is there any mercy? Is there any grace? Is there any love in God's house? All right. And see, and see what happens is we, we get bent out of shape with that kind of stuff. And we, we, we get all beside ourselves and we miss the whole point that we're supposed to be witnessing for God, not just by what we say, but what, how we live. Amen. Do you understand that some people will only church, the only God they're going to ever experience or see is the lifestyle that you live? They're not going to pick up a Bible, but they'll see your lifestyle, and then that'll, that'll, that'll trigger some things. So how can, I be a, how can I be more merciful? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here we go. Write this down. Start looking and listening for people's needs. You start looking and listening for people, people's needs. All right? In other words, I, 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 I stop being so concerned with just my life and my stuff that I start to look for other people and see who has a need out there and what's going on. You know what I found out? Most people are not paying attention. Now, when I was younger, I used to, you know, be a little, you know, you know even though I was in church, I still was, you know, uh, messing with people. Like, for instance, people would say, hey, how you doing? I'd say, your mama stinks. And then they would say, I'm fine, too. They say, how you doing? Mama stinks. I'm fine, too. They ain't heard nothing I said. Most people don't care how you're really doing. They're just going through the motions and being cordial. But that means we're not really listening. Somebody can say, hey, how you doing? I just lost my job. Fine in you? <laughs> ain't heard nobody. Ain't, I ain't heard nothing. Because here's the reality. We really don't want to know how you're doing. We're just, go, we're just making conversations. But what God wants us to do is to really start looking and listening for people's what? Needs, not their greed. See, when you really pay attention, you're going to find that everybody don't have a need. They're just being greedy and trying to run a con. So now you got to, but if you're not paying attention, you're going to get taken. Now, but if I'm listening, see, if you listen to a person long enough, they'll tell on themselves. Parents, let your teenagers just talk. Just let them talk. They will tell everything without even knowing they're telling them. And you just got to be calm enough to shut up and let them talk. And then later you got all that stuff written down. You said, you know, well, anyway. The Bible says this in Philippians 2, 4, and look out for each other's interests, not just your own. Now, I want you to go to your connection card with me. And on your connection card, on the first one, it says, memorize the memory verse, right? Hopefully you'll check that. I gave you a little business card to go with that little flash card. But then number two, it says, I will start looking and listening for people's needs. I want you to just pay closer attention to what your teenagers are saying, what your families are saying, and, and what they're saying. Because here's what you'll find, that there are a lot of people out there running game, but there's a lot of people out there that you know that really need some help. Now, here's, 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 here's some, some advice on that. Check this out. When people approach you from the street that you don't know, it's okay to be a little skeptical about them. Can I, can I just help you out? Now, this, now this, is, this is Granger, not God. Now, I'm going to tell you my thoughts. When people come up on the street that I don't know, I got a no in my spirit automatically. Nope. Unless God changed my heart. Nope. Let me tell you why. <clears throat> but before we had this building built, we were over on the other side. And right after Bible study, a guy showed up with him and his wife and his kid. And I remember very distinctly that the kid's face was just dirty. Like, it was, like, really dirty. I'm like, why does the kid's face so dirty? And so the guy said, I want to talk to the pastor. I said, okay, what's going on? 
He said, man, my truck ran out of gas on 64. I'm trying to get to Jupo. I got a load on there. I want nobody to steal my load. Could you help us out with some gas? And so we felt sorry for him. And we, you know, our $15 we gave him. 32 days later, he came back to the church with the same truck on 64. Same load, trying to get to the same Jupo with the same dirty-faced kid. And I wanted to throat check him, but the Lord. <laughs> no, seriously. The Holy Spirit of God helped my hand. And I looked him in the face and I said, you don't remember coming here with that same story? And he turned, he turned, he turned blood red. I mean, he was just red. So then I went, you know, we're on 19th and State Street, right? So I went down to Pastor Jackson, who was at 28th and State. I said, hey, man, just, yeah, man, we getting about 15, 12. So then we're around on 111 to uh, Pastor Taylor. Yeah, man, he came around here. We got him about 15 months. He had worked the whole area. And he wasn't a bit more out of gas than the main and the moon. I don't know what that means, but Grandma said it all the time, so I thought I'd put that in there. <laughs> he didn't need no gas. Just the other day, lady came to the church crying, talking about she homeless. So one of the members said, well, you know what? You can spend the night at my house. You ain't got to stand outside nowhere. And in the morning, I'll drop you off at the shelter. And she said, nah, it's all right. I'm just going to go give me some ice cream. Now, I, wasn't in, I was in a different meeting, but I knew the lady, and she ain't a bit more homeless than a man in the moon. <laughs> nice. but, so what happens is when those type of things happen, it causes Christians to want to back up on being merciful, back up on helping people. But see, what you got to do is you got to understand that everybody that, that's, that's coming to you, they might, they, some of them might be playing games, but you know some people in your life, in your circle, who are actually going through something. And so you got to be wise in how you help them. But the, the key is, if I'm going to be more merciful, I got to be more attentive. That's the first point I want to get. Let's turn the page with me. Here we go. Number two. Uh, don't be offended by their sin. See, if I'm going to be merciful, if I'm going to be doing good to people, I can't be offended by their sin. It's amazing how many people that go to church and start living better get act like they ain't never heard nothing, saw nothing, or done nothing. They're like, huh, okay, huh, can't believe you said that. What's that? Are you serious? How you going to play brand new on somebody? Been in church 15 minutes. Now you, huh, huh, huh. No. Ephesians 4 and, and, and 2 says like this. Be humble and what? Gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults but because of your what? Love. When I'm showing love and mercy, I got I to gotta know that everybody I run into is going to have some problems. Nobody is perfect, so it's not if you mess up, it's when you mess up. I can't be shocked. Parents, you can't be shocked when your teenagers say they did some stuff that you can't believe they did. You got to know that no person is above doing something, making a mistake. So you can't be shocked. So look what happened. In the, in the box, write this down. The principle that I want you to take with you today is this. Do not expect unbelievers to act like believers until they what? Are. Don't expect believers to act like unbelievers to act like believers until they are. In other words, when you catch a catfish and pull him out the water, he's not already filleted better than fried. He come out with, he come out with, with uh, skin on him, guts in him, and smelling like fish. He's making some sense. And, and so what happens is, you gotta be you gotta be careful uh, because you can't expect people to be on your level when they just coming in the church. They ain't even, they haven't even joined the church yet. And so we got so here's the deal: we got some people that that come to church and uh, they got their hat on. They're guys. They got their hat on. Oh, you can't have a hat on in Lord's house. Why not? When I went to Israel, let me just help you out. When I went to Israel. I went to the wall, where they, the wailing wall, where we pray, and everybody going over there, touching the wall, putting, put, writing down prayers, sticking them inside the little cracks in the wall. And I'm going, I'm, I'm going to go pray. I'm going to pray for my family, pray for the church, pray for the city. And they said, no, no, you can't pray. I'm like, what's going on? I can't pray. I'm, I, I flew all the way here. I'm going, I'm going to pray. I said, no, your head not covered. You, got, you can't pray to God without head being covered. 
So he gave me this little, this little round, little cup-looking thing to put on my head, like a little beanie thing, and then I could go pray. Now, wait a minute. Over there, you can't pray without a hat. Over here, you can't pray with a hat. <laughs> Who right? I don't know. Man, come on up in here, dog. Come on. We can't get so bent out of shape that we trying to get people to be on our level who not on our level. Let them come in. And so we don't, we don't even talk about no hat. We talk about, hey, how you doing? What's your name? Hey, man, you take your hat off. I ain't even said hi. Hey, man, pull your pants up. You don't even know my name. I don't expect you to, you know what I'm saying? There are some ladies that come to church, and, and, and they're, you know, they're a little too sexy for church. Can I just say it like that? They're a little too sexy for church. How, how do you know? If you're too sexy for church, if when you getting dressed at home and you look in the mirror and you have to keep doing this. Well, all right, we'll be right back into the message in just a moment. But I wanted to just stop and invite you to be a trusted partner with us in our ministry. As we uh, spread the word of God, you have an opportunity to plant some good seeds into good fertile ground. We have a new option for our, uh, for our subscribers and for our viewers, and it's called Text to Give. The number's on your screen. You can uh, type this into your phone and give a, a, a one-time gift or a reoccurring gift. Anything you use will be used for the furtherance of God's kingdom and for His message. Thank you in advance for supporting what we're doing in Christ. God bless. You might be. But guess what? We're not going to trip off of it. We're just going to ask you not to sit in the front row this week. But we understand that this might be your first time. Is it making some sense? Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. Uh, we found out that a lot of young ladies were not trying to be disrespectful. They just didn't know how to shop. Let me tell you what happened. This blew my mind. A lot of ladies, grown ladies, still shop in the junior section. No, for real. Because that's the last place they mama them took them to shop. They don't go to the ladies section. They go to the... And ladies, y'all know that juniors' outfits don't fit all the way on women. They just, they just can't handle it. The outfit ain't designed to handle it. But here's what I discovered. When women know better, they... But you can't expect them to know better till, till we help them. And we just can't come in. You need to do this, you need to do that. No, first we need to know, who are you? We're glad you're here. Welcome to, the, to God's family. And then, we, well, I better them actually took some young ladies shopping and showed them. And they, man, they, shoo, some, shoo. they doing the thing. Because nobody really ever showed, it's making some sense. In other words, I can't be shocked when people don't understand what you understand. Look what Jesus said. I like this. See, see, you know, sweet baby Jesus grew up, and every now and then he had to snap on somebody. Look what he did. This is sweet baby Jesus. Now watch this. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other, what, disruptable sinners. Now, tax collectors were such a sin, they had his own category. Then all the others just fit into this other category. Tax collectors is horrible, right? Because what they would do in the tax collecting back then is that the Roman government had a tax on you. So say, for instance, if the government say, you owe me $5 tax, the tax collector comes and say, you owe $10 tax, give Rome five and keep the other five. And so the people hated the tax collector. They were just crooks. So he said he invited them, he invited Jesus, his disciples, and these Horrible tax collectors and these others, what? Disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees, these are the church folk, these are the, the religious leaders, these are the church people, saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he says, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I, I have come not 
to those who think they are righteous, but to those who know they are sinners. Now, I wasn't there, but I can imagine at somewhere in there, Jesus clapping his hand. Now, first of all, I didn't come for the... <laughs> I wasn't there, though, but I just imagined that he was like, look, I don't know who y'all think y'all are talking to, but I'm going to tell you something. And, and since you think you know so much scripture, go, go learn the meaning of this one. See, the Pharisees missed the boat because they figured if I just keep all the rituals, if I, if I have the communion and I pay my tithe, then all my other stuff don't matter. And some people still think if I just come in here and get a church a check, then pastor, you need to calm down on all that other stuff. Leave me alone. Now I'm gone. But the tithe is a small part of your spiritual life. Your lifestyle is more valuable than your tithe to God. I'm just saying. Mm -hmm. So he says, he says, uh, don't be shocked by their sins. Number three, uh, choose my words carefully. Choose my words carefully. If I'm going to be more merciful, then I got to learn how to monitor my mouth. What? Because some of us, whatever come up, come out. And then you want to invite somebody to church later. Like, no, baby, you didn't cut me up one side and down the other. I ain't going nowhere near your church. He says, well, so he says, when you talk, you should always be kind and pleasant so that you may be able to answer everyone in the way you should. All right? See that? He says, I want you to be kind and, 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 and pleasant with people. So, if it, you know, so sometimes what we say is, is thrown off by how we say it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, I don't know what to say, Pat. Well, see, here's the deal. The Bible says it like this here. In James chapter 3, verse 17, y'all see where I am? Check this out. It says this. But the wisdom from above, talking about heaven, is first of all pure. Look up here. Check this out. Look at me. When we're saying wisdom that's from above, that means there's heavenly, godly wisdom, but then it also means there must be a worldly wisdom. And see, when you are transitioning from being a person of the world to being a child of God, sometimes we bring in worldly wisdom into this spiritual life, and it don't fit. It don't fit. See, in the world, I got to get you before you get me. Because if somebody going to get got, it's not going to be me. I'm in the got er, not the got e. <laughs> Y'all see what I'm saying? But God says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is it making some sense? See, when you're trying to take worldly wisdom into a spiritual arena, it throws everything off. See, now here's the problem, though. Some of us, we got that wisdom from grandma. And I love grandma, but all that stuff wasn't right. <laughs> now, I'm just going to be, hey, 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 don't throw nothing up here. Hey, hey. But the point is, some of that stuff, you know, and some of y'all still ascribing to that. You're trying to be in a holy matrimony, but you're trying to live like you're separate. Now, baby, you put you in this, them, that. Don't put all your stuff together now. Just take care. Just take care. You're going to leave. You got to have your son and father. See, that ain't what the Bible say, though. And, and so you come into the marriage with division. You come into the marriage with, with secrets and, and, and a stash. And then you're wondering why you can't be one. Why you, when you're wondering why there's, there's strife. You know, young men learn from old men. See, dog, you always got to keep you something on the side. Now. You know, in case the old lady get down and cry, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> No, that ain't what the Bible say. One wife. Right? And so we wonder why the marriage is messed up because we brought worldly tools and worldly wisdom into a holy thing and we wonder why it don't fit. He says, he says it's, 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 it's pure, but then it's also it's peace-loving. See, some of us, we look for a fight. We love to argue with folks. 
if you could be for the same team, and, and you could be for this team, and if they somebody else for that team, you'll switch teams just so you can argue with them. Somebody can be saying something. Hey, hey, what you say? Talking to me? Everybody talking to you? Oh, I thought you were talking to me. I wish somebody. I wish somebody would. See, whenever you got that, I wish that somebody would mentality. You're not a lover of peace because you're looking for a fight. I wish somebody would say that to me. Woo! You're not. You're not ready. That's where. That's worldly stuff. And you're wondering why you're turning people off from God and turning people off from Christ. Ah. Making any kind of sense? Mm. He says it's, it's gentle at all times, willing to yield to others. And some of y'all say, Well, I yield to others. No, you don't. I see you driving and somebody trying to get over. <laughs> and then you're going to even look over there. You're going to even... About to run somebody, you're about to ride in their back seat. You're so close to them, right? God says, No. Worldly wisdom say it's okay for you. Go ahead, go ahead. Right? You could be in the grocery store with a whole cart full of stuff. Somebody got four items in their hand. <laughs> well, how, how is that? How is that? How is that? How is that? But I know I yield to people. No, you don't. No. Sometimes you got to yield the remote control. See, nah, nah, see, nah, see, they ain't got nothing to do with God. No, it got something to do with worldly, it got something to do with godly wisdom that you're willing to yield to others. And sometimes you got to let the wife have the remote. And go on watch Lifetime with her. If it ain't but for an hour, give her an hour. Hey, I'm a gay, there you go. It's full of mercy and fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always what? Sincere. Number four, value saving people over keeping rules. Write that down. If I'm going to be more merciful, i got to value saving people over keeping rules. Okay? And so what happens is the church has these traditions and we have these customs that we don't want to let go of and then we wonder why people... Are, are, are not flocking to the church because we're so busy trying to keep all the rituals that don't even matter anymore. People don't even know why we do it. I remember one time when I was a junior deacon, a long time ago, and they was trying to train me how to be a deacon. And, you know, he had to sing them Dr. Watt songs and stuff. I stand up there with the deacons, and they sung the song, I love the Lord. And then he rung the bell, and everybody stood up, and then he rung the bell again, and everybody sat down. So I'm saying, okay, now, why we ring the bell? He didn't know. I said, well, I ain't ringing the bell. <laughs> you know, hey, I was, hey, I was still growing. And no, nobody could tell me why we rang the bell. The pastor didn't even know why we rang the bell. I ain't ringing it then. You know, they, 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 you know, they didn't want me to be a deacon no more. But the point was, <laughs> why are we doing stuff that, that we don't even know why we're doing it? And so but we get so caught up trying to protect this bell ringing and then people going to hell. We're so busy trying to make sure you don't write no hat in here, don't do this. Man, if you, if you, need to work, you know what I found out? That here's the trip, here's the trip. That now in, in the new age, men are having bad hair days. <laughs> See, back in the day, that was a, that was a woman thing. But now men have bad hair day. What do you mean? She didn't finish braiding it last night. <laughs> so, so what are they gonna do? Stay at home or just put a hat on? And come on to church. Now, if you take the hat off, you got braiding it. Woo! Now he ain't finna do that. He just don't. And if you're gonna be insistent on keeping that rule, you're gonna miss a brother. You're gonna miss an opportunity. Sometimes people got the receding hairline. They didn't get a chance to get trimmed up. So hey, I'm just gonna. And if you're so bent on a hat, you're going to miss a soul. So look, look what he says. He says this. This is Jesus snapping one more time. Matthew 23, 23, 23 says this. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law 
and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, right? But you ignore the more important, right, aspects of the law. Justice, mercy, and what? Faith. You should tie, yes. But do not neglect the more important things. Now, get the point. He did say, he did say tie. Don't act like y'all missed that. Don't miss that. But he said there's some more important things as well. All right? He didn't say tip. He said give it real tie. I want y'all, I'm going to challenge you to do that today. As a matter of fact, I want you to really consider, I want to give a, if you've never tied before, I'm going to give a true 10% today and just see what God does. But he says there's some more important things than just giving money. Okay? He says justice, mercy, faith. Those are important things. And so just because you wrote a check or you gave an offering don't mean you got to be that you get the right to be mean to people. Mm -hmm. So turn the page. Places to be an agent of mercy. Here we go, guys. Number one, write this down. I look for people in a crisis or with unmet needs, and I help them. I look for people in a crisis or with unmet needs, and I what? Help them. I look for people in a crisis or with unmet needs, and I help them. Write that down. Here's what happens. He says, when you have changed your attitude about mercy and about being good, then now you got to look for opportunities. Now, here's the deal. Some people are going to be running game, and some people you know got legitimate needs. You got some college students that's really doing good. They got grades, but they run a little to a financial bond. They might need some help with some books. That's what I'm talking about. You got some grandparents who are trying to take care of their grandbabies because whatever happened with mama there, they, hey, the baby, they, 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 trying, they, they trying to battle that plus buy their medicine, right? That's the what? A need. So some of these people coming up with these sad stories with the hospital bracelet and all this kind of stuff with alcohol on their breath and cigarettes in their pocket need $2. That, that ain't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that you know that's trying to turn that corner. That's, they, just, they just need a little boost. Amen? Sometimes you can help people not by giving them something, by helping them gain a skill. Because what I discovered is some people, they have enough income, they just don't have enough skill to manage it. So sometimes it's not that you got to give them another dollar or something. Sometimes you got to show them how to budget. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they say, well, on this check, we pay all, uh, this whole check go to the rent, and then this, this next whole check go to the bills. I'm like, well, why don't you just take a little bit out of each, and that way you ain't always broke? Huh? I said, yeah. See, just because the rent ain't due at this check, don't mean you can't put a little sum aside for the rent when it do come due. And now you got some left here, and then this check comes out, you got some left there. What you say? I said, yeah. <laughs> and guess what? When people know better, they and let me let me give you a little inside scoop here. We have our benevolence. And we, you know, we don't always have a lot of money in there, but we have benevolence. And we help people. But we help people with conditions. Okay, we're going to help you with this, but you means I need you to go to this budgeting class. What do we determine the need is? So there's some things they need to do so that they don't have to be, keep coming back and making benevolence a part of their budget. So sometimes they'll get the help, but they won't follow through with the conditions, and then they'll come back for the help, and we say no. So then they'll go to the membership. Yeah, I tried to go to the church. They, didn't, they, they wouldn't help me, though. There's a reason. Now, you can jump out there and try to help them yourself, but there's a reason. We're not just being mean. See, because I can give you another fish, but I need to teach you how to fish because I can't afford to give you fish every month. And a hush came over here. Right? <laughs> Bible says, share each other's burdens, and this way you obey the law of Christ. Number two, the second way, the second way you can be an agent of mercy is this. Look for people who are grieving and comfort them. Look for people who are grieving and what? Comfort them. See, uh, we, we, we had sent some members to a special training on grief. 
and, and we're, we're actually going back now and, and actively putting together this grief support type of ministry that's going to come in and help people that's going through some. Sometimes people grieving the loss of a loved one or they grieving the loss of a job or a divorce or loss of income. It's, you know, sometimes it's a loss of, of mobility. We have some seniors who used to be very active and independent. Now they're inactive and, and very dependent. And that's, that's a hard, that's hard for them to deal with that. Amen? So they, they go through these, we've got some teenagers and young people, kids in, uh, in elementary school who've witnessed violent crimes and, and murders and shootings and violence, and they've been traumatized by it. They got that uh, PT, yeah, that stuff. They got that. And, and, and they go to school, and people don't realize that this is what this child is dealing with. They just think they're bad. No, they're traumatized, and they need some support. So sometimes helping people goes in different ways like that. So it says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all see where I am? God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. He's not just going to comfort us so we can feel good and be good. He said, I'm doing it so you can feel good, be good, then help somebody. He says, help others. He says, when, when they are troubled, we are able, so underline the word able, to give to them the same comfort God has given us. See, when you go through something, that's God's way of preparing you and making you what? Able. And there's a whole lot of able people in the audience that say, hey, man, that's on, my name Paul. That's on y'all. I'm Bennett, and I ain't in it. But God did not deliver you so you could not be in it. He, he delivered you so now that you are able, you know what it's like. You don't know how they feel, but you know how it feels. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all done lost some children. Some of y'all lost some spouses and some siblings. And you know how it feels. And God said, now can you help somebody else that's going through what you've been through? Mm. Thought I threw that in there. Amen. Here's a one. Right? This is a big one. Write this down. Number three. Look for people needing friends and show hospitality. Look for some people who need a friend and show hospitality. Now, don't act like y'all know what I'm talking about. There's always somebody out there that's kind of socially awkward. They say the wrong thing at the wrong time. They try too hard. They get on everybody's nerves. You're like, oh, Lord, here they are. And you'd rather not be around them. Amen. But sometimes people need somebody to show them some kindness. And sometimes you could be that person that show the person that everybody else is making fun of or, or, or or leaving by themselves, you could bring them in. Sometimes it takes the cool people to invite the less cool people into the, to the room. Amen? Jesus says uh, this. The Bible says this in Romans 12. I'm sorry, Romans 12, 13 says this. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice what? Hospitality. Uh, Jesus said this. When I was a stranger, you what? Invited me in. The last one. Well, let's go to your connection card first. On the connection card, it looks like this. The second one, the third one down says, I will be friends with those who are socially awkward. Sometimes you got a little barbecue or something, you have a little get-together at the house, or y'all going to Applebee's or something with the, after church. Hey, why don't you come with us? Huh? Okay. They would, they, they would love to get an invite. Maybe they ain't got no money that day. You know what? I got you to 15. Don't be, don't be over here ordering over $15 now. Because right. they're awkward. They're awkward. They'll, they'll order all kinds of stuff and get one to go home with. You got to tell them up front. No, no, look here now. You get here at the clown if you want to. You'll be washing dishes up in this mind. Hey, I got 15 on it. I got 15 on it. Because they they, they'll mess up. Because yeah, that's why they don't have no friends. They got a history of messing up. Here we go. Number four, write this down. Look for people who need a second chance and assist them. Look for people who need a second chance and assist them. There's some people in our lives that have messed up. Let me just see the hands of the people in the room who's ever had or needed a second chance. Let me just see the second chance. Look at that. Everybody in the room, even the little kids got their hand up. Yeah. <laughs> So guess what? If you needed a second chance and it helped you, then we need to sometimes be the agent that gives a person another chance. Well, here's the deal. 
you got to be careful because you want to make sure that the second chance is based on the fact that they've shown some improvement and they learn from their mistake. You know what I'm saying? There was a, there was a lady who, who, houses was up, who house was up for taxes. Now, for your house to be up for taxes in this way, that means for three years straight, you ain't paid no property tax. And now they finna take it. Okay, the tax body finna take it. So the family got together and put their money together and saved the house. Three years later, they finna take it again. And they got together, they little changed, they said, look here now. This is the last time. Your house is gone if you let this happen again. That was about 15 years ago, and it was never needed to help her with them taxes again. Them taxes have been paid every year since then. See, sometimes you can't keep handing out without seeing some evidence of, of improvement. Amen? Mm -hmm. You got you got to you got to give some people time to grow. He says, uh, here, "Here's a here's a uh, a testimony from one of our staff. I want to just show what Darwin had to say. Darwin Walker, he's helping us with this today. So he's going to share us a little bit about his testimony. Then I'll be right back to finish up." Hello, New Life family and friends and visitors. I'm Darwin Walker, the Worship Arts Director, and I'd like to share with you why I think uh, doing good in a bad world is so important. Well, let me tell you, I am the youngest of all of my siblings, and uh, as the youngest of, of the siblings, you tend to watch everything. And so uh, my oldest brother, uh, being the tester and, and always trying stuff, um, got caught up. Now, I'm not going to expound on his life except for how it relates to me. Um, being the little brother, you know, you pay attention. You, you watch everything. And I got to a spot where I, I really didn't like um, what I was seeing in his life. And so it had been brought to my attention that, you know, he had done some things that um, affected the family, uh, affected my father's legacy. And and just the family name, and, and I was even more angry and uh, infuriated by it. Um, and so what happened, I, I actually allowed my feelings to shape uh, my thoughts and actions. Um, but then God spoke directly to me uh, through a very familiar scripture. Simply, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Um, and it brought me to recognize that it, Jesus didn't die uh, for my actions, my sins. He died for me. Now, how could I let my brother's actions affect my love for him? Um, he's my brother. Um, as I've grown through uh, my life experiences, I am now able to love a person and, and at the same time hate their actions. Um, because this is what Christ did for me. Um, and, and that's why I take this, this stance um, every chance I get. Um, th things are not necessarily perfect uh, between us, but I do know um, that with my whole heart and completely and unconditionally, uh, I can say I love my brother. Uh, the Bible says, you will know a tree by the fruit it bears. And that's not necessarily uh, for you to see uh, what someone is doing uh, as right as much as it is uh, for you to have as a personal indicator of what you are doing. So, so I figured out if I don't like the fruit that I'm bearing, I need to make uh, some adjustments. Uh, monitor my spiritual diet, you know, what I'm, what I'm reading, what I'm taking in. And, and if I have to, just, just plant another tree. Um, and, and I just, that's, that's where it would put me. So let, let your doing good in a bad world uh, be contagious in your life. And, and you too can feel the joy of, of being used by God for his purpose. Amen. 
Anybody got that family member that uh, you ain't got to look at them. Don't look at them now. Now, if you can't think of any family member like that, you might be the family member that somebody else thinking about. I'm, I'm just saying. Here's the deal, though. <clears throat> Sometimes people mess up. And in the process of messing up, they get beat up by they mess up. Look what Jesus said. Well, this is Paul in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 6 and 7. He says, the punishment afflicted on him by the majority is what? Sufficient. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by what? Excess sorrow. See, sometimes the person who did the wrong thing, they already beat themselves up for months on it, and then they didn't, they didn't figure out, okay, I got to do something different, and now it's your time to get your little two cents. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, that's the last thing they want to hear. Sometimes you got to say, okay, you've been through enough. Let's start working toward getting this right. But you got to play that case by case. Amen? And so uh, there are some people that need a second chance. So what I want you to do is look at your connection card one more time. And the connection card, uh, it says, I will assist those who learned from their mistakes with a second chance. Sometimes you can say, you know what, I see that you've been through enough. I see that you kind of got the message here. Let's see how I can help you. And, and then you start helping them with find the resources they need. So if you can check that box, that'll be right on time. Now, the last fill-in on your outline is this. It says this. Accept God's mercy and share it with others. Write that down. Accept God's mercy and share it with others. Now, here's the deal. It's hard to be merciful to others if you have not received mercy yourself. And the way we talk about receiving mercy here is the fact that God, through Jesus Christ, wants to save you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to heal you. So let's go to your connection card. And there's some boxes there that says, you know, I want to join church today. I want to accept Christ for the first time today. I want to be baptized. And there's some other opportunities there. And so what I want to do is I want to give you an opportunity to give God your life. So you can check any of those boxes that apply to you. Uh, if you want to sign up for some of the other activities that we have with the clean up, the escape room, and the, all those kind of things, let's make sure that we are doing what we need to do in that regard. Over to the right-hand side, some awesome volunteer opportunities and sign up time to serve in ministry. You can check any of those boxes, and you can get some information sent to you and get set up. So let's go ahead, and let's um, stand together, if you're able to stand, as we prepare to extend the invitation to Christ. Now, so that means you can come forward or you can check the boxes on your connection card. And when the offering bucket comes down your row, just drop your offering and your connection card in there and we will receive that. Would you pray with me as we stand together? Those who are able to stand. If you're not able, I understand. God, we love you today. We thank you right now for your word. God, we know that you've been merciful to us. Help us to be merciful to others, God. We need you like never before. Come into our life. Forgive us of our sin. Make us brand new on the inside. God. Help us to be nice and kind and merciful and, and do good even in a mean and bad world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here and you want to come forward and join church or receive prayer or get baptized, whatever you want to do, just come and we'll take it to the side. I want you to come.